and this morning is part three of why I'm not an atheist. And so we've talked about this, and of course, if you're joining us new, I'm going to skim through this fast, but make sure we're on the same page. I do live with a feet, with a feet, with a foot. I live with feet in two different worlds, or a foot in each of two worlds. I am a lawyer by profession, and I am a Christian by profession of faith. And so in that, I approach these matters of proof as a lawyer would in a courtroom. And so I look at it, and what is the proof of atheism that would make me want to be an atheist? We've talked about how important it is if you're going to believe something and claim that it is true. You need to prove that it is true. You can say, well, I don't know if it's true or not, and then you don't have to prove it. But if you're going to make a claim, A is true then you need to be able to prove that A is true. And that burden is on the person who makes the claim. That's very important because one of the principal reasons people tell you they're an atheist is because you cannot prove there's a God. Well, that's not your obligation unless you're saying, I believe there's a God. If you say that, you need to offer some reasons why. But if someone on their own is making the affirmative claim, I believe there is no God, then they need to be able to prove it. That's the burden of proof. Otherwise, you need to be something else. So I'm looking at this and I'm saying, where's the proof there is no God? If you can prove to me there's no God, hey, I'm joining you. But if you cannot prove there's no God, you've got no basis for being an atheist. I would suggest instead you need to be an agnostic. You see, an atheist is someone who says there is no God. An, it comes from the Greek theist, theos, which means God, and you put A in front, and it means not a God. An agnostic comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means no, as in K-N-O-W. And, and then you put A in front of that, and it means you don't know. So an agnostic is someone who says, I don't know if there's a God or not. Now, we looked last week at the four horsemen of the new atheism. We looked at the people who claim to be the thought leaders for new atheism. And I'm not going to repeat what we did with them last week. You can either go back and watch the lesson online or you can read the lesson. But the four horsemen of the new atheism do not really prove their atheism at all. If anything, what they do is some type of sleight of hand. They'll shift the burden of proof. And they'll say nobody can prove there's a God. Well, I'm going to get to that. That's coming next week as we begin agnosticism. And I'll tell you why I'm not an agnostic. But don't sit there and tell me atheism is true if you cannot prove your atheism. The atheist needs to be able to prove that there is no God. But they're not able to prove that. So they shift the burden of proof. Or what they'll do is use logical fallacies They'll use rhetorical uh, uh, techniques and tricks. It's basically, yeah, logical magic tricks. Hocus pocus. So they use logical tricks. They use rhetoric. It's very much a, a wordy sleight of hand. They're magician tricks with words. And so we talked about that last week, and we looked at it from the four horsemen. Now, what I want to do this week is I want to look at what the Internet says. Because most of the arguments that you and I will face in the marketplace, unless you're talking to some of the four horsemen, and one of them's dead, so you won't be talking to Hitchens, but it, at least if you are, you're at, well, Madam Cleo's dead too, so that's not even going to help. Um, uh, uh, I would suggest you're not really talking to Christopher Hitchens. 
But if you get on the internet, and let's say you get on Google, and you ask the Googlers, where is the proof there is no God? This is the page that comes up after the, the ad. There's one ad, but uh, uh, as of this morning, this is the page that comes up. And the first one is God is imaginary. 50 simple proofs. Now, I cruised down and I looked at each of those, but the one that I found most interesting at first was the bottom one. Finally, proof there is no God by News 24. Hey, I'm going on that one. Here's what it says. April 19, 2013, finally, atheists can proudly announce we have proof for the non-existence of God and indeed any God that believers in such things might dot 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 I thought I'm going here this is the kind of stuff we need to look at so I clicked on it here it is finally atheists can proudly announce that we have proof for the non-existence of God and indeed any God that believers in such things might care to name and this isn't just some flimsy bit of rhetoric thrown together to fill a logical gap in a debate. It's irrefutable evidence that proves beyond any doubt that there simply are no gods in the universe or outside it, if that means anything. Atheists pride themselves on clear thought and high standards of proof. Because we're dealing here with literally a life and death issue. <clears throat> Most atheists have been schooled in both the religious and the scientific modes of thought. And the evidence we're talking about that proves the non-existence of God transcends these philosophical frameworks in a way non-existence of God, oh, in a way that renders them incapable of delivering a refutation. Our proof is not based on science, and it most certainly is not based on faith. Now, in order to understand this evidence, it's necessary to open oneself to the possibility there's no God. And not just intellectually, but honestly and fervently with one's entire being. The religious claim that the evidence isn't visible, but we simply can't show it to someone who doesn't want to see it. It can't be deduced from the laws of logic or through the use of any style of rhetoric. Nor can it be seen or detected by any man-made instrument. Atheists know this evidence to be true as certainly as the sun rose this morning. Rejoice! Because we have the evidence required to free ourselves from the petty dogma of religious belief, the sophistry, the lies, and the false doctrines and the praising, oh God, the endless praising. To believers who challenge us and accuse us of not having this evidence, I say, prove we don't. <laughs> I can't get any better an example of shifting the burden of proof than that. I have absolute proof there is no God. It's absolute, it's irrefutable, it's not based on anything I can show you or anything I can say, but it's there, and if you don't believe it, then prove I'm wrong. <laughs> That's what that says. Now that may be, I'm going to give the writer the benefit of the doubt, that may be tongue-in-cheek mocking of the viewpoint that some believers in God give, but I assure you, it does not accurately mock my reasons for believing in God. And we'll cover those next week and the weeks following. But let me just assure you that there are absolutely good, clear, logical reasons to believe in the existence of God. Now, I'm not there yet. Because what I'm doing right now is telling you why I'm not an atheist. I'm looking at what proof they've got that atheism is true. And there's nothing there other than shifting the burden of proof. So let's go back to Google. Look at that top one. God is imaginary. 50 simple proofs. It's easy to prove God's imaginary. 
Start at the beginning with proof number one, or try these five all-time favorites. Uh, notice there's no scientific evidence. So here are his proofs. Proof number one, try praying. <clears throat> How might we prove that God is imaginary? One way would be to find a contradiction between the definition of God and the God we experience in the real world. This writer continues to say, what would happen if we get down on our knees and pray to God in this way? Dear God, almighty, all-powerful, all-loving creator of the universe, we pray to you to cure every case of cancer on this planet tonight. We pray in faith, knowing you will bless us as you describe in, he cites several scriptures, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. We pray sincerely, knowing that when God answers this completely heartfelt, unselfish, non-materialistic prayer, it will glorify God and help millions of people in remarkable ways. Will anything happen? No, of course not. So this is his first proof. The very lead that he puts into his thing to make you want to read more. It's basically, let's do an experiment Let's get all of the Christians together to pray, God, cure all the cancer in the world tonight. Here is the test to see if God's there. Okay. That's an absurdity. Let me start out by saying that what this individual seems to do is he seems to have a particular problem with particular views of Scripture and the Christian faith. And if that's what he's got problems with, I'd love to understand why he has those problems. I've looked the fella up. He's published a book on this. His last name is Brain, B-R-A-I-N. <laughs> or at least that's his pen name. He's got a degree in electrical engineering and a Master of Science degree in computer science, or so he says. I mean, I'm taking him at his word here. You would think he could come up with something better than this for his first proof. Because <laughs> he wants God to be what he's defining God to be. We don't define God. He certainly is not using the God of the Bible, even though he claims to, by using scriptural references. But the God in the Bible is not our genie, where we just rub the magic lamp and tell him what to do, and he does it. And if he fails to give us our three wishes, well, there must be no God. Because if there was a God, he would, he would grant my wish. If there was a God, he would at least be as good as the concierge at the local hotel. Or the bellboy. I say, come get my luggage. He comes and gets my luggage. I tell God, come get my luggage. My luggage stays there. Must not be a God. <laughs> Billions of people in the world. And Mr. Brain... Wants God to drop everything and move his luggage. He would say, no, 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 Mark, you're not being fair. I didn't say move my luggage. I said cure people of cancer. Because in Mr. Brain's mind, that needs to be done. All of us have friends who have cancer or have had cancer. And all of us pray for those people. And sometimes those people are healed. And sometimes they're not. I would challenge Mr. Brain to understand that the God of the Bible heals through the world in which he made as well. And if you go to M.D. Anderson and through the wonders of science manage to find some healing, you ought to give credit and glory to God who made the world the way it is. 
and inspired people to go to work at MD Anderson to investigate to find cures. You do investigation into the scientific developments of Western civilization. They are based upon a Christian Jew Jewish view of God. This idea of try praying, I would suggest Mr. Brain needs to try reading first. <laughs> because if he's going to quote scripture, I'd suggest he start early on in Matthew. Look first at Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. Because this is Mr. Brain's argument. Mr. Brain is saying that if the God of the Bible is real, then you ought to be able to pray for everyone with cancer to be cured and God will cure them all in one fell swoop. Put him to the test. Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came and said to him, If you're the Son of God, turn stones into bread. Now, Matthew's writing this. This is in the Christian Bible. We believe Jesus is the Son of God. We believe Jesus could turn the stones into bread. Did he? Jesus says, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus didn't need to prove his divinity to the devil, to the tempter. Then the devil took him to the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down, because it's written, and he quotes the psalm that says, He will command his angels concerning you. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Satan has no trouble quoting scripture to Jesus to try and tempt Jesus to do something to prove his divinity. Jesus' response is to quote another part of Scripture and says, you will not put the Lord your God to the test. I mean, just because God doesn't answer Mr. Brain's prayer to cure all cancer does not mean that God doesn't exist. It might mean that there's not a God that does things the way Mr. Brain would if Mr. Brain were God. It might mean that there's a God who exists who doesn't like Mr. Brain. I, I, don't get me wrong. I think God loves you, Mr. Brain. But, but you're not proving anything by this. It might mean that God has another agenda, Mr. Brain, and that God's goal is not to rid everyone in this world of cancer. Now, Mr. Brain later will say, oh, then he's an evil God. No, he's not an evil God. If he's given a life after this life to his children. So I would suggest Mr. Brain not just quote one scripture here or there. But get the gist of scripture including Matthew 6. In Matthew 6 Jesus taught his apostles and his followers how to pray. He says don't heap up empty phrases like the Gentiles do. Don't be like them. Your father knows what you need before you ask. So pray like this. Here's how you're supposed to pray, Mr. Brain. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Pray for God's name to be hallowed. Um... Hagios Thamai is, is the Greek here. It, it means to, to, to be holy, to be set apart, to be consecrated. That by name we mean who God is in His essence, His character, His reputation. That it would be different than everyone else's. That His kingdom would come and His will would be done. If it's the will of God to cure everyone of cancer tonight, you pray for everyone of cancer to be cured, and it will happen. I promise you. Now, does that mean it's not the will of God to cure everyone with cancer tonight? Yes, that means it. 
Does that mean there's a harsh God who's not going to cure everybody of cancer? No. That means there's a kind and loving God who recognizes the sin and the condition of this world and our fallen bodies and blesses us with what we need to live in this world to execute His plans, but also redeems us out of this world. Unlike Mr. Brain, I don't fear death. Unlike Mr. Brain, dying is not the end of the world to me. There is no sting to death. Now, Mr. Brain would say, you're an idiot, and that's fine, Mr. Brain. I'd invite you to come to class, and we could discuss it further. But I will pray the way the Lord taught me to pray, and I will pray for His will, that it would be done on earth as it is in heaven, that I'll be given my daily bread, I'll be forgiven of my sins, and that he will lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. And if you pray that, Mr. Brain, I think you'd be surprised at how God answers your prayers. So, try praying. That's, that's not logical. That, I, mean, I, I would say try praying. Honestly, I think prayer does work. Pastor Avery made a great example of how prayer works this morning. But I say pray. Here's proof number two. It's closely related. Statistically analyze prayer. Now these are the kinds of proofs that really get my goat as a lawyer. Okay? And this is the kind of stuff, honestly, this chaps my lips. Look at this. <clears throat> The fact is, now this I'm quoting here, Mr. Brain. The fact is, God never answers prayers. Oh, Mr. Brain, let me tell you how wrong you are. The entire idea that God answers prayers is an illusion created by human imagination. How do we know that answered prayers are illusions? We perform scientific experiments. Now, watch this hocus pocus. We simply perform scientific experiments. We ask a group of believers, he says, to pray for something, and then we watch what happens. What we find whenever, whenever we test the efficacy of prayer scientifically is that it has zero effect. It doesn't matter who prays. It doesn't matter if we pray to God, Allah, Vishnu, Zeus, Ra. Oh, that's, he's like the Egyptian sun god. I didn't know anybody was praying to him these days, but anyway. Or any other human god. Doesn't matter what we pray about. If we perform scientific double-blind tests on prayer, and if the prayers involve something concrete and measurable, for example, healing people with cancer, we know there is zero effect from prayer. And if you don't believe that, take Mr. Brain's word for it. Because that's the best you're going to get. Although, Mr. Brain does say, <clears throat> every single answered prayer is nothing more than a coincidence. Both scientific experiments, scientific experiments and your everyday observations of the world show this to be the case every, every single time. For example, this article... He didn't tell you which article it is, but you can see it's blue because if you click on it, you can find where you can buy the article for 10 bucks. For example, this article says, one of the most rigorous, scientifically rigorous studies yet, published earlier this month, found that the prayers of a distant congregation did not reduce the major complications or death rate in patients hospitalized for heart treatments. Now you're reading this, you might think, oh my gosh. Mr. Brain has an argument. Well, what Mr. Brain has done is once again played hocus pocus with you. Let me tell you, I got the article. It ain't worth 10 bucks, I'll tell you that too. <laughs> it was in the Boston Globe. Scientists attempt to measure the healing power of prayer. And here's what Mr. Brain is referencing. Over a six-month period, the study found no difference in serious side effects, death rate, or readmissions between the patients who received prayers and those who did not. Now, 
we're going to have a little bit of study class. Did you know there are people who have degrees in studies? I had, uh, as an expert witness in one of the cases I tried, the world's leading authority on the difference between a good study and a bad study. He teaches at Harvard, and this is his specialty. Can you believe that? There is a fella at Harvard whose entire life is wrapped up in teaching you how to do a good study or a bad study and criticizing studies that have been done. Now, this is a study where there are two groups. Let's get it here. You've got, in, in these two groups, one group of sick people. And another group of sick people. And all of these sick people are being prayed for, okay? Trust me, those are people. Okay. Oh, they're sick. Um, all those people are getting prayed for. Okay? In this group. These are prayed by a group. And these are not prayed by a group. And so what they did in this study is they took this group that was being prayed for by a church like out in the West. So let's say uh, these are people, this whole thing's taking place in Florida. I don't remember where it was. I, I don't think it was Florida, but I'm saying Florida. Um, this group's being paid, prayed for far away, maybe all the way as California. All right? And this group's not being prayed for. And then at the end of the study, they compared to see how these people did to how these people did. And there was no statistical difference. Now, if you just hear that, you may start thinking, whoa, Mr. Brain is right. Let me teach you something about studies. This is what's called a control group. These studies about the effectiveness of prayer are notoriously impossible to really do well because you can never get a control group. What you would need is you would need these people who are not going to be prayed for, you'd need to sit them down and you'd need to say, John, I know you've got cancer. And I know you're concerned about living. But John, we're going to do a study. And you're going to be in the control group. Which means we're going to ask you, do not pray about your health. Don't let any of your friends pray for your health. Put out an appeal. If anybody hears I'm sick with cancer, do not pray for me because we're going to do a control group and I need to be in the group that nobody's praying for. That's not done. So the church in California may not have been praying for these people. Well, that doesn't mean they weren't being prayed for. In fact, if we go back to the PowerPoint... If Mr. Brain would read the rest of the article, he would read, Krukoff, who authored the article, cautioned against concluding that prayer doesn't work based on his study. Nearly 90% of all the patients participating said someone was praying for them, separate from the prayers commissioned by the researchers. The study, in effect, measured whether Distant prayer was a booster shot to the local prayer. The study offers no evidence about bedside prayer by patients themselves or loved ones. Krukov said he didn't even attempt to look at that because of ethical and logistical problems. There's an ethical problem saying, hey, I understand you may be dying of heart disease. Would you please not pray for yourself so we can do a test? Mr. Brain is playing hocus pocus with you. He's using logical fallacies. He's using rhetorical tricks. Statistically analyzed prayer. Did you notice how many times he said not a single study. Nothing has ever shown. 
In academic medicine in 2001, Edward Halperin from the Duke Medical School wrote an art, published a peer-reviewed article, Should Academic Medical Centers Conduct Clinical Trials of the Efficacy of Intercessory Prayer? Now, he says a recent article in Time described a clinical trial conducted in the heart unit of a VA hospital. Patients undergoing invasive procedures were randomized into two groups. Some were prayed for by Buddhists, Catholics, and an interdenominational Christian prayer center, as well as Jews and other supplicants. So, I mean, they're covering like every religious group they possibly can in prayer on one side. The control group were the remaining patients not being prayed for. The study was designed to determine whether prayers by strangers might influence the medical outcomes of 30 patients in the cardiac cath lab. The magazine reported the outcomes of those prayed over were 50 to 100 percent better than those of a control group. The primary investigator felt these results were sufficient to be intriguing. A larger scale study is planned. Now again, these studies are very difficult to design. And I'm not suggesting that this study proves prayer does work, though I do have an atheist doctor who teaches at Brown University who is an avowed atheist. I argue with him all the time. My dear friend, an avowed atheist will tell me, hey, you put the weight of the studies in the balance and studies show prayer works. To say there's not a single study, Mr. Brain, is... is either very poor researching or it's a lie. Statistically analyzed prayer. That same article references Joyce, the efficacy of prayer, a double-blind clinical trial in the Journal of Chronic Diseases that showed prayer works. Collip, the efficacy of prayer, a triple-blind study in the Medical Times that showed that prayer works. Sicker, Moore, and others, a randomized double-blind study of the effect of distant healing in a population with advanced AIDS showed that prayer works. Harris, Gouda, and Kolb, a randomized control trial of the effects of remote intercessory prayer on outcomes showed that prayer works. Doesn't work in all of the findings of all of the studies. But there are affirmative findings in each of those that showed that prayer works. And that's even recognizing the problem you have with these studies. Now, I don't have time to do this great detail at the rest of Mr. Brain's arguments. But I throw some of them up here recognizing we've got four plus five, nine more minutes. Look at all the historical gods. Okay, well that's a non sequitur. I mean, listen to this argument. I'll do it quickly. Um, there's no such thing as Zeus. Therefore, there can't be any such thing as God. For there to be one God, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who is one God, for there to be one God, according to the logic of Mr. Brain, there must be a bunch of other gods too. And do you see the absurdity of that? That's like saying, since there's no Bugs Bunny, we know there are no rabbits. Bugs Bunny is fictional, ergo, no rabbits. Peter Cottontail, fictional, therefore, no rabbits. Well, no, there are rabbits. The fact that Zeus may be a fictional god doesn't mean that there's no god. That, that's just, that's a non sequitur in Latin. That just, that doesn't follow. That's, that's Swiss cheese logic with holes all in it. Think about science. Okay, science shows God to me. You want to know why? Um, I'll tell you over the next few weeks some more. But I'm sorry, I can't, I can't fathom the intricacies of science without saying, holy shamoly, literally, something's behind all of this. I mean, there's still the issue that we'll talk about later of, okay, it all comes from the Big Bang. Well, where is the Big Bang coming from? Where's that substance? We'll talk about that later. Read the Bible. Well, he doesn't like God. He reads the Bible and he sees things about God that he doesn't like. Well, that doesn't mean God doesn't exist. Just because you don't like him. I mean, I love my wife, but there's some things about her I don't like. None come to mind. 
but I'm sure there must be. Let me try to step out of this gracefully. My wife loves me, but there are things about me she does not like. I mean, just because you don't like God doesn't mean he doesn't exist. That's a silly argument. Ponder God's plan. Ah, uh, we don't have time for that. I, I do. It's amazing. Um, understand religious delusion. Um, religious delusion is not religious delusion. The idea that we actually believe there's a God is, is not delusion. We don't have time to talk about that. Near-death experiences, they cut both ways. Some of those near-death experiences seem to affirm God. Some of them may not. I don't trust near-death experiences because I haven't had one. Though, when I get home, I may. <laughs> Understand ambiguity. This is his chance argument again. Here's the way he says it. Let's imagine you have cancer and you're a believer. You pray to God for a cure. You undergo surgery and chemotherapy, and the cancer goes into remission. What cured you? The chemotherapy or God? I guess it never occurs to him all of the above might be an option. In other words, is there any way to know whether God's playing a role or not when we pray? The problem is that in this imagined case, there's ambiguity. The Christian believes God answered the prayer. It could also be simple coincidence. Look at this. All scientific evidence clearly indicates it is in fact a coincidence. Whenever we do a scientific experiment on the efficacy of prayer, the data shows no effect from prayer. Scientific evidence indicates answered prayers really are coincidence every single time. You want proof? He says, see this proof. Click. You click on the button, it takes you back to his number two we already looked at, where he miscites the Boston Globe argument. And this fellow would get thrown out of court. He would not be qualified as an expert to offer this kinds of testimony. It's not, it's not right. You can't just say, hey, all scientific evidence clearly indicates, well, what about this study in this peer-reviewed scientific article? Uh... Well, what about this one? This one? This one? How many do you need before you'll say, well, maybe not all scientific evidence. Maybe it said the cherry-picked scientific evidence that I want, not even taking into account the fact that the author of the study says that it can't be used to say what I'm saying it says. Mr. Brain needs some help. That's false and a cop-out. And I love number 10. Watch the offering plate, i.e., we're in it for the money. Mr. Brain, come to our class. We don't take up a collection. Mr. Brain, I don't do this because I get paid. I don't get a dime out of this. I do this because the Lord has put it on my heart and told me this is what I want you to do, Mark. And heaven help me if I don't do it right because I'm not doing it for y'all. I'm not doing it for me. I'm trying to do it for the king. I don't, this isn't about money. Look, I'm just going to stun you. But I have a paying job. I could be making money right now. I have people who pay lots and lots of money for my time. I could take four hours every Sunday morning, not counting the time to write the class, not counting the time to teach the class. Look, I could take you all to lunch if I wouldn't be here. It's not about that. But Mr. Brain puts that in there. And you know what's right next to it? The ad for you to buy his book. <laughs> now, Mr. Brain may say, but Mark, you have a book. All profits from my book are donated. I don't get a dime off of that. I'll still buy you a copy, Mr. Brain, and give it to you. 
I mean, it's not all about the money. The Apostle Paul gave up the money to do what he did. And he's the one who wrote our points for home, which I'm going to say again, but I'll put a little different angle on them today. Paul wrote and he said, What can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. Mr. Brain, the whole fact that you're trying to work these reasons out, your whole ability to reason, is something that's amazing in and of itself. It's something that is unique to you as a human that sets you apart from all the other living beings. My dog, Tizzy, is a marvelous dog. Actually, it's Sarah's dog. Sorry, Sarah. Is a marvelous dog, but Tizzy's not sitting around contemplating the universe. We need to understand what we're looking for. The fact we're even contemplating this says something may be out there. You're certainly not proving it's not. Paul continues to say God's invisible attributes, invisible attributes, His eternal power. His eternal power is not something we're going to see in Him curing everyone of cancer tonight. Then Brain would get upset because God, Brain would be upset because God might cure a future Adolf Hitler. He'd say, well, look at God. God interrupted and cured him of cancer when he should have been dying. I mean, we don't understand the brain, it ain't big enough. God's eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. You want to see the power of God? You want to see His divine nature? Look at science. Look at what happens at MD Anderson. Look at how we put people into space. Look at the cell phones. Look at the biology of a cell. We've got an ability to see the power and nature of God if we'll just know what we're looking for and recognize it when we see it. And we never want to become someone who thinks that they are the ultimate brain. Although they knew God, they didn't honor Him as God. They didn't give thanks to Him. They became futile in their thinking. Their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. We pray for Mr. Brain, we pray for ourselves, we pray for anybody who thinks that they've trumped God because of their reason. That's why I'm not an atheist. Come next week and let me tell you why I'm not an agnostic. Can I pray a blessing over you? Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would bless my friends and those listening today. Awaken in their hearts, Father, an awareness of you. Rekindle that flame within them. Even Mr. Brain, Lord, I pray for the the three living horsemen of the new atheism. Father, we lift up in prayer and pray that you will soften their hearts, quicken their spirits, clean out their ears, drop the scales from their eyes, move their pride aside, move their arrogance aside, move the haughtiness aside, move the know-it-all aside, and let them look with wonderment upon who you are and what you've done and what you wait to do in their lives. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.